This week's episode of the Salt and Sauce Chat Show is sponsored by North Broad Street Records, bringing you the very best in unissued music. North Broad Street Records discovers and brings to vinyl cool, unfinished gems. For more information, please visit www.northbroadst.co.uk. Coming up on this week's Salt and Sauce Chat Show. These Tory bastards go up and they vote against giving kids in England, poor kids in England, a one hot meal a day. People used to say to me, Big brother is, you must have been nervous. And I'm saying nervous. Fuck's sake. I'm walking into your house. <laughs> try try going into jail and getting strip cells. That's nervous. Yep. So that's the that's the story around about Kelly, you know? Oh, Celtic. Yeah. The gangsta in paradise <laughs> comes to paradise. <laughs> Brilliant. Welcome along to the Salt and Sauce Show, I'm David Simmons, this is Series 2 and our first guest on the show is a man you'll all know and love, uh, he's former celebrity big brother housemate, politician, huge Celtic fan and a man not afraid of conflict, ladies and gentlemen, we've got Tommy Sheridan on the show today, thanks for coming in Tommy. David, that was a wonderful introduction mate, Thank you. Um, <laughs> only a fiver uh, cost me, uh, but it was very very nice of you, I'm not sure everybody would uh, endorse the love but uh, maybe... Love or hate is, is more appropriate, but hey, what the hell. <laughs> we'll go with love, Tommy, why not? Eh? So, I mean, where do we start the interview? Like I say, you're being a celebrity Big Brother housemate, a politician, you're a big Celtic fan, you're into your football. But one thing I've noticed, and I say this quite a lot in my interviews, is doing my research. One thing I've noticed about you, Tommy, is whatever subject you're talking about, you're fiery and you're passionate. Where do you think that originates from, mate? My mother, Davey. My, my, my mother was um, a big influence on my life. Parents are usually big influence on... on sons and daughters lives my mum as I was growing up um, she had uh, left school without any qualifications as many of her generation did um, got various jobs in factories and the like but she also worked in pubs right. and while she was working in pubs she got involved with the Transport General Workers Union um, and um, she joined the union and then she tried to get the rest of her bar staff to join the union she was a very good recruiter um, she was uh, a good talker, and eventually the union made her a sort of a semi full time uh, organizer. So she was working in the pub and working for the union. Um, and my mom, uh, to claim to fame, was in the uh, 70s. She led the first strike against tenant Caledonian brewers because right. tenant Caledonian wouldn't recognize trade unions, so they wouldn't negotiate wage rates for the staff. In those days, the staff were paid buttons. I mean, I know they're low paid now, but even even worse in those days. And what was also worse was the conditions they were working in because they had to work all sorts of overtime that they weren't getting paid for. So when the, the, the pub shut, staff had to stay behind, clean up, get ready for the next day, but they weren't getting paid for it. And often they were getting home after the work and there was no transport. So they were having to pay themselves to get taxis and all the rest of it. So loads of things that my mom was taking up. The union, union were backing her, but Tenet Caledonians wouldn't um, negotiate. So they organised a strike, and everybody laughed and said, oh, you tore a bit. You can't pick at the pubs. If you if one pub's picketed, they'll go to another pub. It's just stupid. You'll never win that. And, of course, they never picketed the pubs. They picketed the brewery. Right. And in their days, all the tanker drivers were all in the TGWU. After two days, they won. <laughs> the, the breweries collapsed because none of the pubs were getting the deliveries of the, of the, of the beer. Um, so the, that was my mom's claim to fame. She also went on to um, get the union first time ever. She get, she was very involved in a movement called the Battered Wives Movement, right? Um, which I used to hate as a kid because my mom used to get phone calls at all times of the night um, and have to leave the house and go to other hussies um, to, to take women out of hussies because they'd been battered and I was always dead worried my mom was going to get hurt um, but my mom got the Transport Engineering Workers Union to back the Battered Wives Movement to build a refuge because one of the things in those days was why don't you just leave you know you're getting battered now why don't you just leave and of course the problem was there was nowhere to go yeah. um, so they built a refuge um, and that Battered Wives Movement Evolved into what we now know as women's aid. Oh wow! So that was that was the, the formation, the early formation of women's aid. So my mum was very much involved in all that as I was growing up. And I used to say, she says this to me all the time. I used to say that I hate the trade unions. 
because she was always going to meetings and she was always going. So I used to grow up. Saying, I hate the unions. I hate the unions. <laughs> um, and then she said, "Was I was a wee kid?" She says, "I was always going to buy her a taxi, right?" Because she was always waiting a taxi. <laughs> so from when you say to me, "Where do I get my passion and my fire from?" Undoubtedly, without being conscious about it, that's where I got it from. My mom in 1972 um, sat me on uh, her knee because uh, I was greeting. I was eight years of age and the lights had went out uh, and I wanted to play with my wee soldiers. I had all my wee soldiers out in the, the carpet and I couldn't get playing with them um, because the lights went out. And my mom sat me on her knee and explained to me why the lights went out. And it was, she told me about the miners going down very, very deep into the ground to extract coal, which then was used to generate electricity. The electricity then gave us the light, but they were treated really badly and they were getting paid really badly. And that's why they went straight. Now, at the time, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying, I, I, I then said, oh, all right, that's okay then, Ma. I'm quite sure I was like, ah, I couldn't care less, I want to play my Zojis. <laughs> but the point I'm going to make to you, David, is when you're getting told that at eight years of age, yep. inevitably, when you grow up, these stories stick with you. Um, and that's what made me quite political and, and develop, a, I would argue, a keen sense of social justice of what's right and what's wrong. Yeah. So that's where I got my passion for you. And, and anything I'm involved in in life, um, I tend to be passionate about. Aye. So, I mean, like you say, that's where the fire in the belly came from, your mum. Your father, he was a, a hugely inspirational figure in your sort of football inside. Because you're a big football man, Tommy, aren't you? I, I, I'm always very wary of no leaving my dad out because um, my mum and dad, if I'm absolutely honest, David, they weren't the best couple in the world, right? I mean, they, they probably, again, typical of that generation, get married quite young uh, when they probably weren't ready to get married. Yeah. But then in those days, you didn't tend to get divorced and all the rest of it. So they stuck together and they were wonderful parents. Absolutely. I've got two older sisters. They were wonderful parents to us. Only that good a couple, to be honest. My yeah. mum always, always working at different shifts, different times. My dad, he ended up having to do the night shift all the time in the Rolls Royce factory in Hillerton. Um, so it was like ships passing in the night. Yeah, you know, yeah. my dad was coming in, my mum was going out, all that type of stuff. So, um, but my dad, he was a massive Celtic supporter. He was involved with uh, St. Brendan's Celtic Supporters Club, which uh, ran its bus for Linwood, but it picked up in uh, Pays Road West in, in Glasgow outside the Argosy pub. So as a wee kid for six, seven, eight years of age, ten years of age, I just I was at every single game. And at home and away. I mean I remember Methyl 74 watching uh, Celtic winning the seven, um, thinking how it was such a tiny grun. I remember going to Easter Road and getting pelted with bottles because uh, <laughs> the, the, the Hibs fans in the days were pretty brutal. Um, and I also remember Hibs being a brilliant team and, as I was growing up because we, we played them in two cup finals. 72 was absolutely brilliant. As a wee kid, uh, I had to get moved because whatever had happened, there was too many in one part of the grun and we had to go into the gravel and get moved to another part of the grun. I think it was the last... If I'm not mistaken, I think it was one of the last games in uh, Scotland where there was over 100,000 at a match. Wow. Um, and uh, that was the famous uh, Dixie Dean's hat trick, which was absolutely tremendous. Um, but a couple of years later, 74, he scored another hat trick. And again against Hibs. <laughs> Poor Joe uh, Baker, uh, Joe Harper, sorry. He scored a hat trick that day, I know, but it was in the, the losing team. We won 6 3. Um, so those were days for me, I just loved uh, going to. Especially parking, but I love going to the, all the other grounds as well. I remember getting off the buses, and nowadays they would be banned. But when you get off the buses, all you had was the inhalation of the poisonous fumes as, as we all walked towards the park because the, the buses would all park at the, 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 one, the one spot. Um, so I loved um, growing up being a Celtic fan in the days. And it's, 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 Fond it's, memories. It's, it's interesting, David, because um, you know, you've know you got all the kerfuffle and all the furore over Neil Lennon. And, we had the same when it was Gordon Strachan. We had the same when it was Wim Janssen. We had the same when it was uh, Ronnie Delia. We had the same when it was Jock Steen. Yep. I remember my dad and, and my uncle Jim, because we all went together on the bus and you would come back for the, the games and Tommy Callaghan shouldn't have got a game and Jim Brogan's finished and, and uh, Vic Davidson should be getting a better chance. Th these were all the, the stories in these days uh, about the, the, the club and people were saying, oh, the manager's not doing the right thing. So these, th these things go with the territory. I just think it's over the top now uh, with, with a lot of that. But as a, as a, a, a kid, 
I feel sometimes guilty because that was my dad's life. Yep. And then run about the age of 10, 11, um, my next door, my, uh, next close to me in Pollock, I stayed in Pollock, tenement buildings in Pollock, Linton Hall Road in Pollock. Loved, loved staying there. I mean, houses were terrible and damp ridden and all the rest of it, but you didn't, you didn't notice. You thought everybody's house was like that because we were all in the same boat. Yep. Um, and I was playing football in the wee triangle across the road phase and the guy next uh, close, Mr Little, his name was, said to me, you're quite good with that ball. Have you ever played for me? He says, no, I've never ever played. He says, you should come down to Paul United. Um, and for, he invited me down for a trial. Um, it was in a school near to me, Howford School. And from then on, I started playing with Paul United. Yep. So for the age of about 10 onwards. But then what happened is, my dad was obviously over the moon that was playing football. So he started coming to watch me instead of going to watch the Selic. Um, and then... He started the Mr. Little and others says to my dad, would you mind helping out? And within a year, my dad was running yep. the team. Uh, he was the manager of the team. And then, of course, he speaks to his brother, my Uncle Jim, and he says, why don't you come and help me? So before <laughs> you know it, my dad and my Uncle Jim are running the team, which obviously is yeah. the only reason I go to a game. Um, <laughs> but they ended up running it for under 11s, right up to under 18s. My dad ran the, and ended up becoming the president of the club, oh, well. Paul United. Paul United in these days, Dave, I mean, everybody will have their own story. Uh, Glasgow United, Posso YM, all these different amateur football teams were absolutely vital in the days because they gave us what we meant by community. Yep. Paul United, we used to train twice a week. We used to play at least once on a Saturday, sometimes on a Sunday as well. But... Friday nights, we used to have discos. Right. Houford School discos, they were famous. That's where we went and we all used to slag each other about our gear and who was a who was a mod and who was a punk and who was a poser <laughs> and all the rest of it. It was part of our lives, part of our upbringings. And the truth is, in the days, a lot of the boys running about Pollock, some were running about with, with blades, some of them were running about with glue. I lost a good pal, Tam McGurn, uh, age of 16. Sniffing the glue, thought he could swim, fell in the water, bloody drowned. Um, Paul United gave us a purpose. Mm -hmm. It gave us something to take us away from that. Um, and it maybe stopped us going down the rang roads in terms of uh, getting into the booze, getting into the drugs, getting into the gang warfare and all the rest of it. Because there was a lot of that was going on at the time. So my dad, therefore, because I speak to my, I speak about my mom. In a big political sense, she yeah. gave me a, she gave me the idea of big politics. But your father introduced you to football. My dad gave us the yeah. mini, the the, the 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 community politics, if you like. Right. And therefore, I'm, unfortunately, my dad's no longer with us. My mum's still living, but my dad's no longer with us. But uh, I'm eternally grateful to my dad for doing that. So, like you said, your dad introduced you to football. Um, you hope you don't mind me saying, at the age of fifty six, you're still playing just now, aren't you? You like a wee game of fives, and you play for the. The Celtic charity team as well. So. I love playing football. Dave, uh, uh, my advice to anybody um, who plays football is don't get up till you can't play because you'll regret it. Yep. I, I, pl I was still playing junior football at 42. Uh, I played with, with a second season with the Ants. I, I, I played with about six or seven junior football teams. Played with a lot of call of all teams, uh, <laughs> which, which is quite surprising. That was in the uh, season 83-84. Uh, I was at uh, university at the time and uh, my brother-in-law at the time was playing with, with Lark Hall. He used to play with Albion Rovers and he'd uh, big Peter Allen and um, he'd stopped playing with the Albion Rovers and, La and Lark Hall had um, tapped him up. So he was playing with Lark Hall but they were struggling a wee bit for players and he, he recommended to the boss, uh, my, my uh, brother-in-law is quite a good wee player and all that. So I got a trial with Lark Hall. It turns out it was a guy called Jordy Dixon who was a big Queen of the South legend. Hard as nails. <laughs> Um, and Jordy loved me because in those days I was very fit uh, I was very firm I was used to playing in midfield and I would I would tackle anything um, so he loved me uh, me and a big boy called Jerry Hamilton who was a fantastic player a beautiful left foot hard as nails and me and Jerry were the two midfielders um, two were the only Tims in the team um, we, we used to laugh actually because the gas works where we played for Lark Call I remember they playing Blantyre Celtic from the League Cup section a rainy Wednesday night and the wee gas works and, uh, we stayed there when it was mob we were a lot of calls and they were shouting come on the sons of William 
<laughs> of course, me and, me and Jerry are big Tim's with that. I get stuck in anyway. We, we won. We got to two cup finals that year. Oh, yeah. um, we lap call. Unfortunately, we beat with Paul twice, which... which Irony <laughs> is an irony because that's where I came from, and I never ever got to play with Pollock Juniors, which was which was a regret. Um, but I played with Lark Call, I played with the Benburb, uh, I played with Bayliston, played with School Bride, played with St Anthony's. Um, loved my junior football. It was it was tough, but it was uh, whole hearted stuff. Um, and uh, played with loads of really good amateur teams as well at a high level. Um, Tenant Caledonian League in, in those days was was, was nearly junior mm. uh, uh, level. So I've always um, loved playing. Um, as a youngster, I used to have to sneak out the house, Davy, because my dad would never ever of all the games he took me, never take me to a Celtic Rangers game. Really? Um, yeah, later on, I was always moaning about it, and he says, "No, I'm, I don't want you seeing the poison and the bile, and, and I don't want you going near it." And so I had to, you know, when I was old enough. 15, 16, I used to sneak out um, and go to the games. Yep. And I had to stay with my mate and all that stuff to, to, to hide it from my dad. Um, but um, I used to sneak out with tie colours and all my scarves. <laughs> and of course, my mate Monty, he's gone to the games with Union Jacks and all the rest of it, you know. But so we haven't fought with your mates during these sort of games? We, or? We, 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 we would fought, we would fought, seeing the Saturday night, we would argue about the game. It was never a penalty. Uh, Tommy McLean dived and Tom Forsyth had dirty this and dirty that and they, he would be slagging Roy Aitken it was just all that type of things would be going on um, but we were very very close still are yep. um, but in those days as I was growing up David I wanted to be a footballer so I didn't drink I uh, was very into fitness because my mate Billy was also wanted to be a footballer and it just shows you that, you know he had talent I didn't he because he went on to carve out a career for himself, yep. um, played with um, St Mirren, played with Mullow, played briefly with Rangers, and then went on to become a very good manager and all the rest of it. So um, it just shows you sometimes it can work out if you get the right breaks. Uh, so th- I had a very, very happy childhood, despite the social conditions. Yeah. Uh, Pollock, in those days, it was just full of... Lots of really good characters, uh, and yeah, we had a share of poverty, we had a share of low wages, we had a share of violence. There was a, a lot of that going on, but it was overwhelmingly good people daily, yeah. you know. Um, and I, I just loved living there and loved the area. Um, oh, yeah. it, wasn't, it wasn't until I went to Stirling Uni when I was seventeen that I began to realise that no, everybody lived in the same conditions yeah. as me, you know. So well, that kind of leads me up to my next question, Tommy, because I, I mean, you've, you're quite a highly decorated man, educationally wise. Anyway, certainly you've got three degrees. Is that right? Um, how does how does a young lad for three Pollock degrees and a diploma? Wow. Well. So I, I don't know. <laughs> so how does a young lad for Pollock progress on to end up with three degrees, like you say? David, when I was growing up, I wanted to be a mechanic. I wanted to be a motor mechanic, right? right. Which is. People would laugh at me, and all my mates would laugh at me, and my wife would certainly laugh at me because I can hardly <laughs> use a screwdriver, and I mean, fix a motor. But my uncle, when I was growing up, used to be fix motors, and I used to love watching them fixing them. Motor. I thought, oh, I'm going to be a mechanic. Um, but my teachers says to my mom, you should aim a bit higher, he should, he should stay on, do his hires, he should go further. And I didn't want to do anything up because I just wanted to leave school, wanted to play football, wanted to be a professional footballer if I could, and if I couldn't be a mechanic. But my mum said to me, no, you're going to stay on at school, you're going to stay on at school. My dad was like, oh, let him. There was talk at the time, St Johnston had been looking at some of their games and there was talk of them offering an apprenticeship right. uh, in those days. Uh, but it would have meant moving to Perth and all the rest of it. And I had a big choice because my mum wanted us to go to uni. My dad wanted us to, to pursue the Perth thing. But anyway, what happened was, um, I says to my mum, oh, I want to change the world and all that. My mum says, if you want to change the world, son, you need to learn how it works first. That's why you're going to uni. Um, so she sent me took her advice. back into Stirling Uni. I'd, I'd, I'd offers for uh, Glasgow, Strathclyde and Stirling. Yep. And my mom says, I want you to go to Stirling because you're going to move away from the house and you're going to learn to live mm-hmm. yourself. And what did you study when you went there? Went there and I studied economics and politics. Right. So I did my joint honours degree in economics and politics, did my dissertation on Karl Marx's theory of value um, and um, I loved it um, it coincided with a minor strike 1983 84 um, and I, I became the picket bus organiser at, at Stirling um, 
was very, very involved in the strike, uh, doing as much as I could. Uh, when I, as a kid growing up, Dave, I'd never read any books, you know, and, I, and I, it's the one thing I keep telling my daughter, read, read, read. But the point I'm making is I wish when I was younger I'd read more mm -hmm. um, because then when I went to uni and I started to read, and I was reading because I had to rather than because I wanted to, but it opened all sorts of uh, windows and doors and curtains because I could then see the world and understand things and how they worked. So um, I, I got my degree, I studied between 81 and 85. Um, so did you move right into politics <coughs> after uni? No, no I started working with Strathclyde Regional Council. I worked um, with, uh, it was called the Hypothermia Programme. I was a team leader and our job with the Regional Council at the time was to identify vulnerable pensioners right, okay. uh, and to visit them and give them advice about how to run and manage their houses in particular their energy because hypothermia I mean who could believe it this was the 1980s and it's still happening but elderly people dying in their houses for hypothermia in a country like Scotland yep. it's rich in oil and gas it just pissed me off the idea of the injustice of it all um, but we were a I mean, it's so bad. We were to identify the vulnerable, then we were to visit them, and we were to give them advice about how to keep their heating on and how to use their heating. And then we would advise them to wear socks in bed, wear a hat, and we used to get them wee thermometers. Yeah. To Excuse to my ignorance, Tommy, but was there still quite a lot of like, coal fires going on back in those days, or was it kind uh, of were, past that? Or? Uh, it, was, it was more... The biggest problem in the 80s wasn't so much the coal fires. A lot of people had the coal fires... But the biggest problem then was was the radiators. People right. used to have these radiators and the old... Uh, Were they expensive to run or...? Ah, that's the problem. Yep. Massively expensive to run. Massively expensive. And pensioners end up having to put their heating off because they couldn't afford that. And anyway, so that I worked on that for a year. Um, and then um, I was very active in politics through all of this. I joined NUPI. It was the union in my... National Union of Public Employees, it doesn't exist anymore, but that was my union and I was a steward and all the rest of it. But what happened then was um, the militant wanted me to become like a full-time organiser for them, right. um, which was, was a promise of uh, very little income, but, but loads of work. Um, however, this was now about 87, um, and I became the youth organiser, I got involved in strikes against the y, the compulsory YTS, they were going to make the YTS scheme a compulsory scheme so that you left school, instead of getting an apprenticeship, you had to go into one of these slave labour YTS schemes, so we were involved in organising school strikes against it and all the rest, to try to change the government. Um, and then, by about um, 80, um, 88, was when the whole talk about the poll tax yeah. We called it the community charge in the day. Yeah. I'm going to talk to you about the poll tax okay. shortly, well, Tommy. But so, that, so, that, that, so I left, when I left <laughs> unit first, I worked with, a, with, with the council for a year. Before and the politics. Worked with the militant. Perfect. Because if anybody says, oh, what, what's Tommy Sheridan's involvement in politics? You say, oh, he's a socialist. Now, I, I'm not big in politics. I hold my hands up and it's something I'm, I'm slightly ashamed of. But what is socialism? Like a dummy's guide to socialism. What is it in case anybody's sort of like me that's not 100% sure exactly what Cl socialism is? Classically, Davey, I mean... I, I, Socialism to me is having a sense of right and wrong. So socialism to me is about right and injustice, standing up against injustice, um, trying to redistribute wealth so that everybody has a fair share, right. everybody has a fair crack of the whip. Bill Shankly famously, um, I'll paraphrase him, but Bill Shankly famously, because he was a ex miner who grew up in a tough, tough environment, um, considered himself a socialist and he said, my idea of socialism is where everyone works hard and everyone shares in the rewards. It's the way I see football. It's the way I see life. Um, and that, to me, is a very good definition because socialism isn't about um, making sure everybody has got nothing. Socialism isn't about levelling down. Mm -hmm. Socialism is about levelling up. Socialism is about giving everybody the ability to have a nice house and a couple of holidays and a decent car and a proper income for the what they do. To be able to heat their house like what we discussed. Exactly, exactly. Um, you know, there's an old saying about we don't have hunger in the world because we 
we haven't got enough food to feed people. It's that we've not got enough for the greed of the wealthy. That's the problems in the world. That if you look at the wealth that exists, uh, David, it is absolutely incredible, the wealth that exists. So why have we got poverty? Mm -hmm. Because so few people control the wealth. So socialism is about saying, no, that's wrong. Why is it the case that when you put on a switch in your house to put the light on, you're putting money in somebody's private pocket? Why when you flush the toilet in England are you putting money in somebody's private pocket? Why when you flick on the gas to uh, boil some milk are you putting money in somebody's pocket? The point I'm making here is electricity is essential. Mm -hmm. Gas is essential. Water is essential. So why are they privately owned? Yep. <laughs> why are we get them in private hands instead of public hands? No, I get that. Why transport, railways, the buses, why are they run by the private sector instead of being in the public sector so that we can run them on the basis of safety, on the basis of cheapness and affordability? Why do we have a situation where you've got the banking system, the financial system, run by private hands so that you put your money away week after week, month after month, but then when you want to borrow some money, they charge you for borrowing money and they squeeze the market, they invest in all sorts of unethical projects and then when they've been so greedy, they crash and we bail them out. We did it in 1929, we did it in 2008, we bail them out. Why are these things not socialised? Why don't we have a socialised financial sector? But like that. Everybody nowadays uh, tends to be in a credit union. The credit union philosophy is what a socialised financial system would look like. Electricity, gas, water, these things should all be public. That's what socialism is for me. Socialism is the commonwealth being owned and controlled by the people. Yep. So that you elect people to administer these things, but they're run not on the basis of maximising profit, they're run on the basis of maximising the production, so that there's no want in the world. There's no, why do we have people literally starving? Mm -hmm. Literally starving when we're throwing away butter mountains, and wine lakes yeah. in the European Union. It's, uh, it's funny you say about the starving it's side. Down. Yeah, this, the, obviously talking about the like, starving side of things. One thing that's been in the news recently, and something that you've championed in the past, is the whole free school meal situation uh, that Marcus Rashford's fighting so hard against just now. What's your views on that, Tommy? David, I got elected to the Scottish Parliament in 1999 and um, I had a couple of things that I was determined to do. One of the first things I wanted to do was to abolish a thing called warrant sales, which for a lot of your younger viewers, uh, they wouldn't have a clue what it is. But a warrant sale existed um, way hundreds of years ago. They used it during the Highland Clearances when they decided, the English lords decided that it would be more effective to have sheep grazing in the land than people living in it. So they decided they would move people and when people didn't want to move, they decided they'd forcibly move them. So they, they, shent, they sent in um, sheriff officers um, to forcibly uh, evict people for their homes. Um, and what they used to do is they used to conduct what's called warrant sales. They would sell the wee bits of property to make money to pay for the rent that people couldn't afford to pay. And I couldn't believe, as I was fighting the poll tax, I couldn't believe that these things still existed. Um, mm. So that you couldn't afford to pay the poll tax. So what they do is send sheriff officers to your house. They take your telly, they take your coffee table, um, they, they take your uh, wee display cabinet and they'd sell it in order to, to recoup. Pay, to, in order to pay the poll tax. And they never ever paid the poll tax because you never ever got the money back for what the thing's worth because when it went to a warrant sale, nobody ever paid the right price because it was an auction. So that so, was the first thing you thought when you so, went into it? So when, I, when I, I, I get put into jail in 1992 uh, because of stopping a warrant sale. Um, and when I was in jail, and I'm shocked to actually know that far from here, uh, when I was in jail, I got, to, I, I got asked to stand British Parliament to, to stand in the um, April um, 2002 election, uh, general election. Um, so I stood as a candidate for the jail, um, which was the first time it happened in Scotland. It's happened in other countries. Famously, Eugene Debs in America got over a million votes in his prison cell. Um, and I stood and I came second. So I got over 20% of the vote. So in May, which was the month later, um, I stood as a councillor and 
remarkably get elected from a prison cell to be a councillor. Um, so I couldn't take up my seat for several months because I was still in jail. <laughs> but I, I, I got elected as a councillor um, and I came out and we continued to fight the warrant sales and then the Scottish Parliament got introduced and I stood in 99 as a socialist um, for the Parliament. I got elected and I said, I'm going to Parliament. Um, I get sent there on behalf of the poll tax army I'm going to go there and I'm going to abolish warrant sales. And when I got to Scottish Parliament, I soon found out how to go about it. My, all my education had done me well, and I found out how to move what's called a private member's bill. So instead of waiting for the government to do something, I did it myself. Right. I got a fantastic lawyer, a guy called Mike Daly for, for uh, the Govern Law Centre, to write me the bill. So he wrote me a bill to abolish warrant sales. I approached a guy called John McCallion. A Labour MSP, a guy called Alec Neil, who's an SNP MSP, I says to him, look, I'm going to try and get this through Parliament. Mm -hmm. Would you sponsor it? And both of them agreed to sponsor it. So that gave me cross-party support right away. So sorry to interrupt on me, because there's a famous TV show that's on Channel 5, I think, called Don't Pay, We'll Take It Away. Right. Which is basically what you're saying, they'll come to your house, and if you can't pay your bills, we will take this. But that can't be done in Scotland, can it? Is that no, because of you? It, it can be done in, in, in Scotland, partly because, not just because of me, yeah. because of me and hundreds of people like me, yeah. because what happened is we decided that we wanted to change Scotland. Scottish Parliament's there, so why don't we change it? Why don't we stop the barbaric practice of humiliating people because they're poor? Because it's nothing to do with raising the money. You never ever raise the money, but what you do is you humiliate somebody. And what the sheriff officers were doing is that we're getting people fuller and fuller into debt. Because when you get the letter saying, if you don't pay this, we're going to come and pin you, and that means price your goods, and then we're going to take away the goods and sell them. What do you do? You go and borrow money for somewhere else yeah. to pay that bill. Where do you go? You go to the Prudential and you get £2,000 rates of interest, or you go to a loan shark where if you don't pay, you get kneecapped. That's what was happening to working class people. Yeah. They were getting forced further and deeper into debt to pay these bills, particularly the poll tax and the heating bills, and we said, no, this is just wrong. This is just absolutely immoral. So, went to the Scottish Parliament, uh, moved this bill. It's quite an interesting wee story here because, sorry, it's a wee bit going off no, track. No, you so go Apologise for that, Dave. But it is an interesting wee story because it does tell you a wee bit about the politics at the surface and politics under the surface. Because there's a guy called Donald Dewar who's got a statue erected yeah, to yeah. him in Glasgow. Was he first minister big, at one point? Big statue. He was the first, he was the first, first, first minister, minister. Yeah. Uh, in the new Scottish Parliament. And while he was the first minister, he was also the, the leader of the Labour Party, um, famous QC and lawyer. Um, and Donald Dewar had a meeting the day that the warrant sales bill, abolition of warrant sales bill, was to be discussed in Parliament. It was an emergency Labour group meeting call for all the Labour MSPs to come together to decide what their position was going to be. Mm -hmm. And Donald Dewar called the meeting and he got out of sick bed because he'd had a heart attack. Um, so he was off. But he came in for this meeting um, and he ordered all the MSPs to be there and it took place in the Friends meeting house near to the temporary parliament because we were meeting in the Church of Scotland Assembly uh, Hall at the time. Um, the friends meeting house was just across the road and down the hill um, and he gathered them all together and he told them that they were to vote against the bill so they were to vote down the bill I'm trying to abolish pendings and warrant sales and Donald Dewar for drum chapel is trying to keep them and what happened that day and obviously I know because John McCallion was at the meeting uh, he was a Labour MSP at the time and what happened was several of the MSPs put their hands up and said, we can't do it. We can't do it because Sheridan will exploit it. How can I stand up in Glasgow and say I voted to keep warrant sales when it comes to the next election? They're, they're going to exploit it. No way I can vote for this. No way I can vote for this. And one by one by one, they all said... They against them. And what happened was they abstained. Now, the reason I tell you that wee story is because Jim Wallace, who <laughs> remarkably is probably going to become the new... Church of Scotland leader or something like that. <laughs> Jim Wallace was the leader of the Lib Dems at the time and the, the, the government at the time was a Lib Dem Labour coalition. Jim Wallace was the deputy first minister. And he was to move 
the government's opposition to my bill. Right. So we go into Parliament. It's an afternoon. The, the hall's packed. You're not supposed to speak. None of the audience is supposed to speak. And I move the bill. And the remarkable thing is, brilliant thing was, the local, the committee that had looked at my bill had decided to support it. And this was a cross-party committee. And this was this caused real problems because usually you're supposed to go with whatever the committee says. Yep. But they decided, no way, we can't have this, we can't even... Because, oh, the Sheriff Officer Society, the Law Society, oh, the hoity-toities, oh, the snobs, they'd all say, no, no, we need the warrant sales, we need the... We need, they used to call it, we need the whip hand. We need to have that urge to pay the bills, right? I mean, dirty bandits. They, 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 totally and utterly removed from ordinary people's lives. They wanted to keep this humiliating piece of legislation on, on the statute book. And I stood up and said on behalf of ordinary people, on behalf of the uh, low pay unit, on behalf of the Child Poverty Action Group, on behalf of the Govern Law Centre, I'm up here speaking and saying, get rid of warrant sales. We should never have warrant sales. If you want to get people to pay their bills, you give them options, you give them time to pay, um, you don't carry out warrant sales. Jim Wallace gets up and he makes this big speech about how they're opposed to warrant sales, opposed to the bill. And uh, we need these bill, we need this, but this is, we, we can't get rid of these. And he sits down and then all you see is, look, we rabbits, I mean, the, the, some of the TV sh footage shows you, it's the first time it's ever happened actually. Um, all these wee notes are getting passed through the parliament. <laughs> and of course what happened was, Wallace was now getting told that the position changed and that the Labour MSPs were now no longer going to vote so against did, it. Did he not get the memo? And he hadn't got the memo. Oh. Um, and of course, when it came to the vote, <laughs> the uh, Labour MSPs abstained. Tories voted to keep it. Half of the Lib Dems voted to keep it. Some of them abstained. But all the SNP, myself, the Green, uh, Margo MacDonald, Dennis Canavan, we all voted for it. Rebel MSPs like John uh, McCallie and Elaine, C Elaine Smith, they voted for it and it won. And it was the first time, in fact, it's been the last time that a bill has ever passed that the sitting government didn't want to pass. Right. Um, and it was a great day uh, because it showed that people power could actually work. And the way I looked at it, Davey, was from a prison cell to parliament, yep. from a prison uniform to a nice suit, I'd managed to articulate the need for a bit of change in right. Scotland. Uh, and we managed to get that bill passed. Now, what happened was um, we, we, we got millions of pounds put into the debt advice centre, uh, sector. Because in those days, money advice, citizens advice, the law centres, they were all struggling to survive. But because of the passage of that bill, it was realised in Scotland, wait a wee minute, if you want to help people not get into debt, and you want to help people pay their debt, you need to give them advice, you need to give them help. And through the bill and through the process, we get millions pumped in to that sector, um, which is which, which is great, and it was it was a step forward. Superb. Um, and by the way, I feel dead rotten, Davey, because I've told you that story, uh. and that story has got it's got a lot to do with the, the, the question you asked me, because the part of the question you asked me is what I did next, because the next bill that I wanted today that pissed me off um, as a kid. We all experienced it. Free school meals were humiliating because dinner tickets. Because people used to get shouted out in the class to go up and get the free school meal ticket, and you therefore knew everybody to get the free school meals, and some of them didn't want to go, so they didn't take up because they felt humiliated. Yep. And I looked at the level of child poverty, Glasgow in particular. This was now we're now into the year two thousand, and I'm thinking we're getting in the twenty first century here, and we've got wins. They're hungry at school. Mm -hmm. We've got terrible records of child poverty. We're getting into the 21st century. And I looked at other countries. The one that I examined more than anything was Finland. Finland since 1948. They did it from an obesity point of view and from a health point of view. And what they said was, we are going to change. Because they had a massive, massive coronary heart disease problem in right. Finland at the time they decided they were going to take a big policy measure to improve the diet of people in Finland. 
and introduce free and healthy school meals for everybody. Finland's now got one of the best health records in the world. In fact, if you look at all the um, re- all the surveys that are done about so the best place to live, so this was your next bill that you moved on to pass about so the free So my meals. next bill was free, healthy, universal school meals for every child in Scotland. And the thing that pisses me off, Dave, I got the SNP to back me up. I got Dave, I got Alec Neil and John McCallum to back me as well. I got Mike Daly to write the bill again. I got the child poverty action. I got the trade union movement involved. They all backed it. The Labour Party opposed it. Really? The Labour Party opposed it. And what, of course it pisses me off now because you look at the Labour Party now saying, oh, free school meals. Free school. Yep. But they opposed it in Scotland in 2001 when it came to the vote. Uh, absolutely disgraceful, uh, their position. But it goes back, doesn't it? That's that point I'm trying to make about politics on the surface and politics underneath the surface. People like Donald Dewar get statues erected to them. But he wanted to keep warrant sales in Scotland. He opposed free school meals. People um, who run the Labour Party in Scotland wanted to stop kids getting the right to a free and healthy school. You know what they used to say? They used to say, oh, universalism doesn't work. Universalism doesn't work. Why do you think things like child benefit work? You don't qualify for child benefit by going through a means test. You qualify by having a kid. That's why it's the most effective benefit. And that's what I wanted to do with, with free school meals. Sorry, Dave. I, no, no. I, I, it was interesting. I, once you start on <laughs> that story, it just develops into... And it's got you the can tell Adams you're still passionate about it, Tommy, which but, is, uh, is refreshing, mate. What pisses me off is the immorality of these... I was going to say bastards. <laughs> um, and I should say bastards because that's what I mean. Because I wrote an article just the other day uh, over this absolute hypocrisy, Davy. Absolute hypocrisy. Where you've got these Tories bleating their wee heart suit about one MP gets up and says that his, his mum is taking terrible phone calls because somebody referred to him as scum in the Houses of Parliament. And the speaker, the deputy speaker of the House, took uh, an MP to task, Angela Rayner, and gave her a right dressing down like a right, almost, almost like taking a cane out and whacking her with it. All because she'd, under her breath, referred to one of these Tories MPs is scum because he'd attacked Andy Burman who was trying to get uh, low-paid workers better coverage for the furlough scheme because of the COVID-19 restrictions. And what gets me is the hypocrisy. These Tory bastards go up and they vote against giving kids in England, poor kids in England, a one hot meal a day and that's fine. But don't you dare call somebody scum. Then you get a dressing down in Parliament. That's not acceptable. It's this... Whole idea that you call them honourable ladies, honourable gentlemen. There's nothing honourable yep. about denying kids a decent meal, Davy. And that pisses me off that we've got a politics and a situation um, the, the day where they get away with murder the Tories. You know, pe- people sometimes say to me, eh, oh, no, all the Tories are the same. I think, I, I don't use the term scum, I prefer Nye Bevan. Nye Bevan. <laughs> July 1948, on the eve of the introduction of the National Health Service, Nye Bevan had to fight tooth and nail against the Tories who were saying, no, 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 we can't have a National Health Service. Keep it to private. The people should be able to pay for their health service. Because that's the way it was. People, poor people couldn't afford to get ill before the health service because they couldn't afford to get a doctor. And Nye Bevan was the architect of the health service and he wanted to have a universal health service so that everybody could get access to health service. And the Tories fought it tooth and nail. And he said, no amount of cajolery, no amount of discussion would convince him that the Tories were anything else than lower than vermin. Lower than vermin um, was the, 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 the phrase he used because of the way they wanted to keep the poor down. Personally, I think he's right. Um, also, wonderful um, expression. Um, I'm trying to remember his name. Oh, God, he's a brilliant author. But he, because people say, oh, no, the Tories are the same. And he made the point. He said, you know, you can have a, a piece of sweet corn embedded in a turd. <laughs> and that sweet corn might keep its consistency and still be a piece of sweet corn. But, it's surrounded by shite, <laughs> and that's what the Tories are. Yeah. That's you know that's the way you've got to look at the Tories. Um, doesn't matter how they try and and, and 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 promote themselves, they are nothing, in my opinion, 
but a shower of bastards <laughs> who try and keep working class people doing David. And um, that's why we need to keep fighting, Paul. That's what makes me a socialist. That's what keeps mm. me going. That, that flame of total and utter uh, burning injustice is still inside me. Um, and we have to try and change things. No, and no. the way to do that, and I know we're jumping forward, but the way right. to do that is going to be an independent Scotland. Because that's, we're going to touch that's what we're going to do. I mean, Sorry, Dave. No, I'm, no, your passion is, is refreshing, mate. And it kind of leads me up to my next question because your passion for politics and socialism has kind of got you in a bit of trouble before because you've touched on it that you spent some time at Her Majesty's hands, if you like. Um, the poll tax, you've touched on this briefly. What, what happened here? What, what was the old poll tax story that found you buying bars? What happened is that the, the Tories decided... Um, that the idea of people paying uh, rates um, was no longer acceptable because rates, for people um, who are wanting to understand that rates were based on the size of your property. Right. So it was a property tax. Now, of course, it doesn't take a genius to work out, does it? The bigger your property, the bigger your rates bill. So in Scotland, 1992, Tories got absolute doing. 1979, they got a doing. They never have a late Thatcher. But they got a doing in uh, 79. They got a, a doing in 85. And then it came to the 89 election. Uh, or sorry, it was 87, was it? Oh, God. I, I, 87, 97, it all comes around into one. But Thatcher was hated and despised in Scotland. And the Scottish Tories were like, uh, listen, one thing you could do for us is... Our supporters in Newton Merns and our supporters in Bears Den and our supporters in leafy parts of Edinburgh, they're really angry because the council keeps putting the rates bill up. Now, councils in those days, they have very, very little financial autonomy. So the one thing that they could uh, devise to get them a wee bit extra income to pay for social work, to pay for school meals, to pay for the school crossing, to, to pay for the refuge collection. The one thing they had a wee bit of autonomy way was they could increase the rates and that would then in, improve their revenue. But if they increase the rates, then the well-off pay more. Right. Now, living in a tenement building, you, you, nobody at that time, I, I, I swear it, nobody in that time could tell you what the rates bill was. Because what you did to the factors office, you didn't pay the rent rate, and you, it was your rent really you were paying. There was a wee bit there for rates, but nobody ever knew what it was because it was so small. Yep. But the TOFs knew what their rates bill was because they were living in big houses. Their rates were going up. So the Tories decided, let's do away with the rates. Let's introduce a different tax. Let's introduce a personal tax so that instead of there being a property tax on the property, let's tax everybody in the property. Wait a wee minute. Everybody in the problem. Yes, everybody over the age of 18 should pay something. And of course, working class households in those days, you know, big hooses. Uh, no, no big hooses, big households. Yeah. You know, uh, two and three sharing bedrooms and all the rest of it. So you, you, maybe sometimes you're a family of five, six, even mere, five, six adults. So instead of a rates bill, which in that day was the average about 300 a year, they were going to give you a poll tax bill, which would be 300 a heat. Oof. So it, it, was, it, was a, it was a wealth transfusion from the poor to the rich. That's, that's what the poll tax was. Um, and we signed petitions, and there was the elect, general election in 80. I'm pretty sure it was 87, because that's where they put it. And they got absolutely gubbed at the election. So there was no democratic mandate for it. But they, we, we were gone in marches and all the rest of it. Nothing was happening. So... Myself and others, we decided to hell with us. We, we took inspiration for uh, the rent strikers doing in Poplar uh, in, in London. We took inspiration for America for the civil rights movement. And we said, well, wait a minute, what about a civil disobedience here? Let's refuse to pay. It meant breaking the law. So a lot of people were worried about it, quite understandably. Uh, we used to have meetings maybe five and six, and then before you know it, it was five and six hundred, and then it was thousands, and when we'd marches... Because people couldn't afford it, Ted Dave. And they wanted to fight. They, they hated Thatcher. A lot of people in those days were saying, oh, you can't fight her. Look at her. She took on the miners. She took on Galtieri. She, she's, uh, she's taken on the, the health workers. She was known in those days as the Iron Lady. Yeah. And we said, we're going to fight her. And the thing that she hadn't accounted for, she gave it to us first. We got it in 1989. We got the poll tax, 89, March 89. Uh, the, the England wasn't to get it to 1990. So they wanted to get it to a year later. 
So we built a movement and we said, no, we're no pain, stick together. We got a right good bit of human solidarity going. People were getting threatened with sheriff officers, so we built all these wee phone trees. We didn't have mobile phones in the days, didn't have computers in the days, but you had phones. Yep. So we built phone trees. And what we did is, whenever somebody got threatened with a sheriff officer, they get a wee letter saying, oh, sheriff officer's going to come to you on the phone. You'd phone one, they'd phone one, they'd phone one, they'd phone ten, boom, boom, boom. Before you know it, hundreds at the door. Wow. Um, we called it the, the flying pickets. Um, <laughs> and we, we managed to make to mobilise people. We didn't know who it was. Nobody knew who the person was. But you knew it was rang what was happening to them. And you assembled outside the close and you stood there and you said, you're not getting in, the sheriff officer. Polis would come inevitably. Oh, you'll need to move. We're not moving. And the police would turn to them and say, nothing you can do. Now, what then happened, of course, sometimes there was a big one in Springburn. It was a day they'd obviously decided they were going to go for it big time. Uh, and they tried, I think it was about a thousand pindons they tried in one day. So we had to mobilise everybody we could. And of course, they, were, they came in heavy. I got arrested right away. Several others. My mom got arrested. Oh, <laughs> uh, we ended up, there was about 20 odd days in the jail. Uh, but Kept in the local police uh, station in, in, in Springburn, but not one pin them was carried out. They reckon upwards of a thousand people took to the streets, wow. stopped the sher sheriff officers getting in. And that was massive. That was absolutely massive. The reason that's so important is because it is a wee build up. Because then what happened in October 1991, um, we had a, a poll tax shop right. in the Gallagher uh, in Glasgow. Poll tax busters, we called it. Um, with with t-shirts. Who are you going to call? Well, that's it. We, we, we used that. We uh, with we t-shirts with the Ghostbusters uh, insignia, and it was poll tax busters. So who are you going to call? <laughs> poll tax busters. So it was brilliant. And what happened is I got a call uh, for this young woman. She was very distressed, very very upset. Turns out she's a lone parent, a couple of weans, and she'd been out, came back, and she'd a letter in her letterbox told her to go down to the local sheriff officers, Abernethy, McIntyre and Greenock, um, in Watt Street. She was to go down to the sheriff officers because they changed her lock. <laughs> While she was out, sheriff officers came with a joiner, took the lock off the door, went in, they took a TV, a display cabinet and a coffee table. Uh, changed the locks, left the note and the lassie was expected to pay for the joiner's time to pay for the new lock, and these things were to be sold at a warrant sale uh, in the 1st October in Glasgow. So it was, it was terrible. The last was distressed. So we said, look, Ken, don't worry. Uh, it'll no go ahead. We'll, we'll stop it. We'll stop it. Would you be able to stop it? We'll stop it. Leave, leave it where it's. Leave it where So we got their details after. And we got the leaflets out. And it was, again, it was, I say, it was no computers in the day, so you got leaflets from run the uh, colleges, the universities, we put up the phone message, attempt to warrant sale, first October, we need to stop it, we need to stop it. Day before it, as I say, I stayed in Lytton Road and Paul, day before it, um, I was in the house, uh, I was a tap dancer, and uh, I, I thought I heard the door, but it went out and there was nobody there. And there was this big bloody envelope, and she left it there outside the, the, the door, I was looking at it, and then I hear a car uh, door opening down. So I, I go into my veranda. I'm a tart look down. Big Peugeot, red Peugeot, 405, two guys in suits, sheriff officers, right? They'd been in my house and they were supposed to hand this to me. But the fly bandits had just put it through the door and it was an interim interdict. They'd went to the court and they'd said to a, a, a sheriff, uh, we want this guy banned for interfering with our warrant sale. So this interim interdict told me, you and anyone else with you are banned from interfering in this warrant sale. So, day before the bloody warrant sale, no, I took it with me, <laughs> stuffed it in the, in, in, in the jacket. We went that morning, oh, it was about six in the morning, we turned up, the gates were shut, at Turnbull Street, Turnbull Street uh, yard. We hear somebody push the, push the gates. Lo and behold, it was open. Oh, oh, God, we, we go in, and there's a blue transit van sitting there. Two sheriff officers sitting in the front, and the lassie's furniture's in the back. They were going to open the van, they, 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 they named the time, I think it was nine o'clock or something, they, they were going to open the van, and it was going to be a mock auction, yeah. right? Because yeah. nobody was going to sell the stuff, but they were going to do it. So we surrounded the van, didn't we? 
the no opening this van. Porsche come, oh Christ, there was a few, <laughs> a few dozen of them. And then a few wee scuffles broke out, I've got to say. Um, <laughs> a few, <laughs> the thing with barriers, the control barriers were upended and shh. <laughs> so they were trying to get us away from the van, we wouldn't leave the van. Uh, and up until then, a lot of it had been friendly. A lot of the stuff we'd been doing was friendly. We, mm. we would sit in front of a close and we wouldn't move. Yep. Polish wouldn't say that. They didn't have enough of them to arrest us, right? But on this day, it got a wee bit out of hand. And I says to the guy, Chief Polish came to see me and he said, Look, hey, Mr. Sheridan, you don't move. People are going to get arrested here. And I says, Look, mate, I've been confronting you for a long, long time. There's never been any violence. Can I tell you this? That van isn't opening. I, I'm t I don't care how many he's come in, that van's not opening. Oh, 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 we better kerfuffle. And then he went away to the in front of the van and he spoke to them. And then he came out with a loud tailor. Today's warrant sale has been cancelled. <laughs> oh, 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 yes! <laughs> and so I'd, I'd made a wee speech. I made a wee speech to everybody, thanking everybody. It was about three or four hundred days turned up. Well, brilliant, absolutely brilliant. Yeah, three or four hundred. And I made this wee speech saying, we have came here today, people power, human solidarity, we have stopped this warrant sale, and we'll stop every other warrant sale as well, you know. I says, this wee bit of paper was supposed to stop us from being, being here. <laughs> and I ripped it up and I threw it up in the air and says, it's no stopping us, oh, yeah. unfortunately. <laughs> unfortunately, everybody told me, oh, don't worry, uh, Tommy, it's uh, just an interim interdict. These, you know, these things get broken all the time because I got a letter within a week uh, telling me that I was to be taken to court. Right. <laughs> and I met my lawyer, a guy called Alan Muller, lovely guy, Alan Muller, he's a director of the Human Rights Centre. Uh, he was a, ca a Casimalt lawyer. And I met him in the Centurion Cafe in, uh, in the Gallagher in, in, in Glasgow. And uh, I said, <laughs> I said, oh, I've got this letter. Uh, Alan, he said, oh, Tommy, don't worry about it. He says, I mean, these things are usually used for abusive partners and people break these interdicts all the time. Now, don't worry about it. A week later, I had to meet him again. They were taking me to the High Court in Edinburgh, and I was yeah. to be taken within two weeks. Uh, and they wanted to do me with incitement to riot and contempt of court. Oh dear. So uh, he, turned, he was a wee bit ashen faced, and he says, Oh, I didn't think they would go this far. But of course, what they wanted to do was make an example. I was just going to say that. That was just going to be one of that. Yeah. They, they, you know, you can't win a victory like that. I mean, I remember, see that day, that warrant seal. It was the front page of the Evening Times. It was the front page of the Daily Record. It was on Radio One. You know, you can't win victories like that and there'll no be something to pay for it, right? Um, and what happened was uh, I got taken to the High Court in, uh, in Edinburgh in front of Lord uh, Kaplan, I think his name was. <laughs> and, uh, oh, he was very pompous and arrested. And I had uh, tried to uh, cause a riot and I'd uh, breached the court law and these interdicts were sacrosanct but here my wee lawyer made up for it Alan made up for his, uh, his, his, his lack of uh, ability to, to, to see what was coming because what happened is they had to gather evidence and the evidence of the riot involved explanation of the scuffles and they, the police brought in all this video evidence they days it wasn't as high yeah, as good yeah. as it is now but they'd taken video evidence and they'd showed the scuffles and all that and here my sharp eyed lawyer he noticed during one of the videos that one of the polis that had given evidence against me, you know, to say that I was there, I'd made a speech, I'd called and people to surround the van and all the rest of it. One of the guys who had given the evidence was in the video in denims with a bomber jacket on and had thrown the first punch. Wow. He's your provocateur wow. in the crowd. <laughs> so Alan, my lawyer, moved the motion once this guy recalled. Oh, the, the prosecution were all out. So they had a meeting, as they usually do, and they dropped the incitement to riot so this guy didn't get pulled back in to be embarrassed. He was actually in the, in the crowd. So it went from incitement to riot and contempt of court to just contempt of court. Um, the reason that was significant was if I'd been done with the incitement to riot, I'd have, I'd have got over a year right. in the jail. What did, you, what did you end up getting I had to harm to get six months. Right. They sentenced me to six months. It was quite funny. I look back and now, you know, you rip a wee bit of paper. <laughs> six months. <laughs> <laughs> it's quite quite harsh. Ah, it is uh, a bit. Quite harsh. Anyway, uh, six months in jail, and they sent me to Salton because I'd been done in the High Court in Edinburgh, which was a bit of a bummer because 
I mean, I'm for Glasgow. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, it's, they sent me to Berlin, at least I'd been in among my own crew, so to speak. <laughs> but they sent me to Edinburgh, um, and uh, I'd never been in... I'd been in uh, police cells, but I'd never been in prison at that time. I'd been arrested for loads of things, but never actually prosecuted. Um how was it? Was it intimidating? Was it? Of course it was. Yeah. Oh, Jesus. It's meant to be, for God's yeah, sake. Yeah, it's prison. Look, Dave, you get sent to a, a prison, mate. First thing that happens, you go in and they'll put you in what's called the wee dug box. Um, and they'll tell you to strip off your clays and they'll give you uh, some clays to put on. Prison garb. Now, by the way, all this might have changed <laughs> recently, but I'm telling you what happened in... Uh, your experience, yeah. 1992. Um, and then, of course, one of the worst things is you come out of the wee dug box, your stuff's put in, uh, kept in a, a box in, in, in the reception unit. And the uh, front of three or four officers, they tell you to strip off. And the strip search, you know, they're, they're, obviously they're doing their job. They don't want any contraband, drugs, mobile phones, or anything getting into mm-hmm. the uh, prison. Although mobile phones in the days wasn't a, yeah. as big a problem as now. It was mostly drugs they were worried about. Um, so you get strip search in front of three or four people in uniforms who you've never met before. Now, that's intimidating. So you see when people say to you uh, about making a speech in front of people, or people used to say to me about the Big Brother house, well, you must have been nervous. And I'm saying, nervous? Fuck sake, I'm walking into a house, <laughs> try, try going into jail and getting strip searched. <laughs> that's nervous, yep. right? Never mind going into Big Brother. Um, and then I get put away to the cells. I get put, uh, lumped up with a boy in, in Peter, uh, never met him before. I think he'd, I think the boy had been done with some road traffic offence or something. Uh, and I remember that first night. Spent the night in Sogden. Next morning, oh, here's this guy shouting early morning, damn Sheridan, damn Sheridan, along the corridor, you know. And I'm, I'm here, I'm here, I'm shouting, I'm here. Uh, next minute he came in, you've made the front page. <laughs> he, shoved, <laughs> he shoved a daily record. Uh, under under the, the cell door and sure enough front page and it, it, I always remember the headline Downfall of the Dodger was and it was me with my handcuffs on leaving the court um, and then the boy shouts out if you need anything Tommy just let me know he never said call me Tam you need anything Tam just let me know I'm for govin <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, uh, I'll look after you and it turns out he was a pass man on the corridor right. and sure enough it's as soon as the cell doors opened, he was in right away. Do you need tea bags? Do you need biscuits? Do you need tobacco? And obviously, I didn't smoke and the rest of it. Um, so, for the first. Did that put you a bit at ease? So of course it did. Of course it did. Uh, you know, even having somebody who, you know, was going to look after you, so to speak. Mm-hmm. And then what happened is uh, I made it be known I was uh, thinking I was going to stand in the general election. As you mentioned uh, earlier, yeah. As yeah. I mentioned earlier. And that caused the authorities real problems. And it goes back to the thing about only getting six months because under the representation of the People's Act, which I'd looked at, uh, they couldn't stop me standing for election. And this was a fucking headache for them <laughs> because um, and they said anybody with a sentence of a year or more is not allowed to stand for election. So I'm looking at that saying, hey, I've only had six Perfect. months. I can stand. <laughs> Perfect. So because of that, there were certain things they had to do. They had to allow me to have a press conference. <laughs> they had to allow me to meet with my election agent. All from Stockton Prison? All from Stockton. So what they then did is they moved me. Right. And I was going to this training for freedom unit. And of course it was like, you know, fire into frying pan type of thing. Because here I'm going for the general population into a unit where there were 18 lifers. <laughs> all had done fucking murders. And I'm thinking, oh, Jesus. <laughs> Uh, anyway, went over and I got put into this room and I remember the first day as if it was yesterday, Dave. Um, I got put into this room and uh, this big, absolute, massive fucking guy uh, come sort of by me as I was going into the room and he picked up this dumbbell. And Dave, I'm not kidding me. I used to do every bit of training. <laughs> this was a fucking barbell to me. Excuse my language. That's all right, mate. Sorry about that. So this was like a barbell, picks it up, takes it, doesn't he say anything to me, walks away and goes upstairs. And I'm thinking, Jesus Christ. So the guy, Ronnie Marie's name was, <laughs> sorry, Jim Ma, prison officer. He says, oh, he says, that's uh, Ronnie. He says, he's a past man in here. He 
she's a wee bit upset. And I'm saying, what's she upset for? He says, you're getting his room. And I'm like, oh, no. He, he, card's marked. He was getting moved. This was the best room I was getting. <laughs> and he was getting moved up. So I thought, what the fuck do I do? And he says, oh, you'll be all right. You'll be all right. And then he explains to me. He says, what happens here now, Tommy, is uh, at nine o'clock, we leave. There's two officers in this unit. We leave and we lock the door. But all the rooms in here, they're open. You can move about if you Oh, no. <laughs> I'm thinking, oh, wait a minute. <laughs> but he didn't sleep that night. Well, uh, and about two minutes after nine, shh, door goes, chat. I'm like, oh, you're trying, trying to be kidding on. I wasn't shitting myself. <laughs> I said, hi, who is it? <laughs> Opens the door. This guy fills the door. Bloody hell. Uh, I'm Ronnie. Hi, hey, how's it going? And he's come out and he reached out and he shook my hand. That was just a bit of mind games earlier. Don't worry, you'll be all right. <laughs> Thank Chris for that. After that, uh, Dave, I've got to say, Ronnie ended up saying to me, come on, we'll do a bit of training. And he took me upstairs and he had his weights and all that. Oh, Jesus Christ. I, I mean, I, I could never, I couldn't lift it, no. Uh, but that, in those days, he got me lifting 100 kilo. I've only done about six reps. 100 kilo, man. Uh, I can't end up coming out of jail looking <laughs> Arnold Schwarzenegger. Um and to be fair, uh, after that day, I would go and play football with the rest of the prison population. They would allow me out to play football and all that. Um, and I tell you what, I was like treated like royalty after that. Okay. Uh, I think partly, some of it was probably to do with Ronnie. I think Ronnie was well known in Edinburgh circles. I think he um, was well, probably feared as well. Mm. And he'd probably put a word out, not to uh. touch us or, or anything like that. But also, we started playing the football, and I was doing good at the football. The boys wanted me to go on their team and all the rest of it. And even more importantly, the poll tax was a massive campaign. Mm -hmm. People respected the fact that I'd went to jail for my beliefs. Um, and, you know, what then happened, I stood for election, had a press conference, caused them all sorts of bother. They, they had to uh, give me these facilities, and I got elected. And you had never heard a cheer like it. Never heard a cheer like it when it, the announcement was made that I got elected with a very, very successful campaign because we forced the Iron Lady to get melted down and put in the political knackers yard because she had to go. When, when the poll tax got beat, she, she had to go. Um, the rest history. Brilliant. You know, that's, that gave you an inkling of how big and broad the anti-poll tax campaign was in those days. So we had the rally, brilliant. I then had to leave. Get a taxi to Glasgow Airport. I had a plane ticket booked to fly to London to go to Trafalgar Square to speak at the big rally in Trafalgar Square. Now, here's the wee story. Uh, I'm late. It looks like I'm going to miss the plane. I was absolutely livid, pissed off. But here, they kept it back a wee bit. Now, this is unheard of. How can they keep a plane back? For me, you know, right? I get onto the plane. And if the first person to speak to me, Tam Sheridan, what are you doing here? And I'd looks up, Gail Healy. Last year I went to school with, was in my modern studies classes. She was always a darling. She was always uh, out of my league. Um, she was beautiful, long black hair. She used to wear the school uniform, perfect, dead, spoke dead proper. She came for Cardonald, I came for Pollock, so she was out of my league. <laughs> um, but here, she was an air stewardess. And what had happened, she told us later, on this, we call it the ship's papers. She's looking at the ship's papers and my name comes up. And she knew about the poll tax because she was quite radical herself. And she saw my name. So she convinced the captain to, to hold wow. for about 10, 15 minutes. No, what you a, know is who you know. Which was, <laughs> a, which was enough to keep me clear. I get on and wherever I was seating, sitting, she said, no, come on, you can, I'll get your seat up here. And she takes me up to the front. And of course, she then starts doing the uh, demonstration, the safety demonstration. And I'm in awe of her. She's absolutely gorgeous, beautiful in her uniform. And I'm thinking, oh, for Christ's sake, man. What? Jesus. <laughs> so she sat beside me. She, she, her pals covered for her today because they were doing all her service and all that. And uh, we got talking away. And I was, mate, I was bold as brass. I was like, oh, chance your arm, you know. <laughs> I says, what are you doing tonight? Because <laughs> I was booked to come back up that night. Yep. I says, what are you doing tonight? She says, oh, I'm, I'm, I, I finish at nine, I think it was. 
And she's, oh, I'm on the, I'm on that flight. I, I'm on that flight. Blah blah blah. And she went away and checked, and sure enough, I was on that flight. I said, you fancy going out for a wee drink afterwards? That? And she says, oh. Like I'm no doing it, if you want. And I was like, oh, yeah, beauty, you know. So I was walking to Clyde and they were like, ah, I'll see you later, girl. You know? So get, I got met at the airport, big boy John Ellen met me. And we had to get the, the tube and all that into the centre of London. And I'm as happy as Larry. Brilliant demonstration, absolutely brilliant. John Ellen telling me there's, it's, it's astounding the amount of people here. Uh, so we're getting in subway. Get off the subway, get into the Trafalgar Square. Couldn't believe it, man. Just wall to wall, banners, people, placards. It was absolutely brilliant. I got led up to the, the plinth at uh, uh, Trafalgar Square. Um, I go up to the square. George Galloway's there. Uh, he's got his wee daughter with him. And Tony Benn speaking. My, my hero, I love Tony. I love Tony. But Tony was speaking. He was absolutely brilliant. I was next up. I was to bring the solidarity and the message for Scotland. Oh, absolutely brilliant. Tony Benn finishes massive cheer. Bloody South African embassy opened. And all these bloody uh, uh, police on the horses oh. charging in. And what then happened was just madness. Right. Absolutely madness. Undoubtedly, there were some people who were uh, happy for a fight. Um, <laughs> but uh, those are ordinary people. I mean, George was dead worried about his wee daughter. Um, so it was just full scale riots, was it? Riot broke. I never get to speak. <laughs> I, oh, never, I never go to speak. Full scale riot breaks out. Um, there was loads of scaffolding, I remember at the time, and there was people throwing uh, scaffolding. And, uh, it was terrible. Uh, it was terrible, but it was also a sign of the anger, an expression of the outrage against Thatcher and everything she stood for. And that was the beginning of the, well, maybe not the beginning of the end, but it was the end for her. Mm. Because she had paraded across the world as this iron lady who was in control of everything. She could beat the miners, she could beat the Galtieri and, and Argentina. She was absolutely invincible. The capital of our country was in riot, burning. Against the place her. was burning. The, the, the riots went all through the night. But then what happens? twist in the tail for me is hundreds and hundreds of people have been arrested. TV, ITV, BBs, they all want people to go on the show. And the anti-poll tax federation says, Tommy, you can't go home. You'll need to stay to, to do all the uh, interviews and you'll, you'll need to visit some of the, the police stations. I've got a date tonight. <laughs> I've got Gail. I've got Gail. Uh, oh, no. And in the days, by the way, there's no mobile no, phones or nothing. They're looking it up on Facebook. No, the new days, text. I'm sorry, I can't even make it. Nothing. So, uh, I go, I stay. I'm, I'm on ITV that night. I'm on BBC, blah, blah, blah. I end up having to stay in London for days. This is 1990. 1992, uh, I stand for the parliament. Uh, sorry, I stand for the council, get elected to the council, and I got a wee card after I got elected. Congratulations to Barbados, <laughs> Gail Healy. Yeah. <gasps> I was like, oh, thank you. She's written to me. She's written to me. I was all happy, you know. Uh, I wrote right back there. And then, from then on in, <laughs> I get up, uh, one for Prague, one for Paris, one for Rome. And then I get this one, it was the funniest one. And it was for. Lothian Road, that was the big hotel on Lothian Road. Sheridan. The, the Sheridan. Uh, it threw me. So we started writing to each other. We'd been at school together. Um, we had a lot in common. I fancied her like hell. Um, and we arranged that when I got out, I was get, I got out in July. Um, we arranged that we'd meet up. And sure enough, we met up. And she told me that she'd waited um, that night. But then she watched the news because it was all other places. And, 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 and she realised. Um, so, but for that time when we started going out with each other, um, and then after about a year or something, we get serious because we, we were not serious to be honest. But we get serious, and then we end up getting married. So the wee love story there. Aye, because, uh, brilliant. The, the, the poll tax uh, campaign brought us together. Any woman that's willing to stop a flight for you, mate, you need to marry that. <laughs> exactly. Definitely. exactly. Definitely. So we touched on your incarceration at like at Bind. Bars really at Sockton, but a bit further on in 2009, you were the fourth housemate to go into a different sort of incarceration, weren't you, Tommy? Because I watched that from start to finish that season. Right. 
I'm not just saying that, Tommy, but it was it was probably my favourite one. So you had Mucha from the Sugar Babes. Uh, you had Latoya Jackson, Michael Jackson's sister. Vern Troyer, who was, of course, probably famous for Mini-Me. You had Coolio, Ben Adams, lead singer in A1. Eureka Johnston, Terry Christian, uh, Michelle Heaton from Liberty X. Tina Malone, actress from Shameless. Uh, and glamour model Lucy Pinder. And obviously, yourself. It's incredible when you think of that line. I know. <laughs> and, and a wee guy for glitch. <laughs> <laughs> Who, who's he? Uh, but anyway, what, what was your highlights, mate, from being well, in the house? Well, obviously, you made friends with like Coolio and Vern and a couple of stories. I mean, what, one of the st- you mentioned Latoya there, and Latoya was uh, she was royalty. Um, in fact, it's the first time Big Brother has, has ever done this. They gave her a separate bedroom. The right. rest is all were sharing bedrooms, um, that, which is what you usually do, but. Latoya must have got it written in her contract that she got her own bedroom. Um, I remember Latoya, uh, one of the days we get called to the kitchen, the kitchen storeroom, and we're all over. And any time they, they, I mean, it's, it's so boring. Whenever the big brother tells you something, you're like, oh, why is it? It's exciting. And we all went into the, the kitchen storeroom, and uh, Latoya comes up behind me and said, uh, what is it? What is it? And I said, that's blankets, it's, it's new blankets. And we'd been in a couple of days and they were going to change the sheets, yeah, yeah. you know. So, so I think it was Kulu or somebody was honing him. And Latoya was behind me. And I turned around and I honed Latoya her sheets. And she says to me, have we to change these ourselves? <laughs> <It's> <laughs> I just burst out laughing. Have we to change these ourselves? Nice. She, she just, that was the way, the way things were. But one of the other days, Latoya... Uh, came into the. I used to go into there. There was this luxury bathroom area with a jacuzzi and all that. I used to go in there and do some exercises, try and keep myself fit and all that. Press up saps and things. And Latoya came in. She used to like to come in and talk to me. Uh, I knew nothing about her, right? Uh, so there was no. I had no agenda where, and she was telling me all about her life. Some of which sounded very, very bad and how mm. exploited she'd been as a kid and all the rest of it. So a lot of it was poor stuff. But here, while we're in there, Big Brother shouts out. Uh, <laughs> Tommy, for the next few minutes, uh, Latoya must repeat everything you say. <laughs> now, at the time, I remember I was talking about, it's funny you mentioned, I think you mentioned earlier about what is socialism. Latoya had asked me that and I was talking about public ownership and right. running the railways and all that. But here, we're in Big Brother, so I, I, I decided to sing, uh, first of all, I sang Flower of Scotland. Mm-hmm. Oh, Flower of Scotland. And it seems so, like she's repeating it. So she right. had to repeat it. And I thought, oh, bugger this, because I knew this would cause all sorts of hassle. <laughs> I started singing Hail, 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 the Celts are here, what the hell do we, and of course she had to say, Hail, Hail, the Celts are here, and of course, then what happens is Coolio, he puts his, his, his he drew the, the, the bathroom door and says, Hey man, what's that song? What's that song? That's bro. Can I get that for the LA Lakers? <laughs> he absolutely loved the song, you yep. know. Um, so that was a great wee part of of, of the wee tittle tattle that was going on. Yeah. Um, but most of the time, Davey, I spent with me, Coolio, and Terry. Right. Used to stay up to all hours of the evening, just talking away, right. talking away, talking away. So Tommy, you mentioned in the Big Brother house, you you became friends with Coolio, and you had them singing "Hail Hail Fee." The big Celtic song. You actually got me Celtic part though, didn't you? Well, first of all, not long after we came out of Big Brother House, I mean, the, the remarkable thing was, David, for this wee guy for Glasgow, I was told before we went in, it's a 21 night show, right? right. It was only on 21 uh, nights. Sometimes Big Brother, they go in four weeks, this one was a 21 uh, nighter. Um, so I thought to myself, you get paid whether you're in for one night or whether you're in for 21 nights. So it was, it was an easy gig. I mean, it was an absolutely easy gig. I couldn't believe, some people used to slag me about, oh, you're in Big Brother, that's terrible, you get... I, mean, I, th- I kept saying to myself, what's terrible about it? What picket line am I crossing? What <laughs> principle am I breaking? Yeah. What, what, what the hell's terrible? But it was snobbery. It was I was, I was lead, reading some uh, columnists. Oh, Mr. Sheridan used to be highfalutin in politics, but now he's down in the gutter because he's went into Big Brother. It was pure and utter snobbery. Yeah. Uh, and, I, and I hated that. I remember before I went in, I met with George Gallagher. George Gallagher went in. He was in the That's 2007, right, I think it was. Or t- Anyways, before me, and, and George was up there in a meeting um, one weekend after I'd been invited in. And I mean, by this time, I knew I was going. I said, George, let's have a wee meeting. Give me a wee bit, a heads up. 
And I remember meeting with George, <coughs> and we met in uh, Mar House. He was staying in Mar House, terrible George. Mm -hmm. uh, and he, he asked me to come and meet him for breakfast. And <coughs> I says to George, I says, George, what do you think? He says, Tommy, I went into Big Brother and I had a plan. I was going to write a new book. I knew there was no pens, no paper, but I was going to write it up here with all of the spare time that you get. By the end of day two, all I wanted to know was who stole the fucking hobnobs. <laughs> and that, that became my <laughs> lesson in what Big Brother was all about. Uh -huh. I realised then that some people forgot what it was. It's a game show! It's yeah. a game show! Don't take it seriously, for Christ's sake. And I went down with that uh, in mind, um, and I ended up, this wee guy for Glasgow that nobody knew, I ended up getting to effectively the semi-final. I was in for 19 nights. Yep. Um, I, got, I was in longer than Latoya, for God's sake, <laughs> which was incredible. Um, Unfortunately, Eureka won it that year. I didn't go on very well with Eureka. Um, I thought she was up her own bum, but there you go. Um, she was very arrogant um, throughout. Uh, her and Coolio didn't go on very well either. <laughs> so what happened is, uh, I, did, I, went, I didn't go to the... Uh, I had to stay for the final night. But the next night, the Saturday night, there was a big party. You know, a traditional big party, right? Um, but that wasn't the compulsory. That was optional, right? They'd paid for a hotel, you know, and drinks, everything was free. But I hadn't seen my daughter, Dave. I hadn't seen my daughter now for 21 nights, right? Now, she was only a wee way. Mm. See, that was the worst. I had never yeah. been away for her for that length of time. And I says, fuck that, I'm not going to the party. And my wife, Gail, had come down. She had to come down for the, the, the final night, the Friday night. And she says, I don't want to go either. And I said, right, let's go up the road. So we went up the road. And Terry and Cooley, and they were all a bit disappointed because they wanted to see us. Nah. But anyway, they then kept in touch. So much so that I think it was two weeks later. Two weeks later, somewhere. It was a Saturday night. And Gail, it's it, it still January because Gail would get everybody around the house. I'd been in the Big Brother. Must be might have only been a week later. Um, and she was making traditional, she was making a lasagna and she was getting everybody around the house. But because it was still January, we had some tartan on and all that. So it must have been near uh, Rabbi Burns' birthday. So the phone goes, Tommy, Tommy, it's cool here. Oh, fuck, how's it going, man? How you going? Hey, man, I'm in Glasgow. Do you want to come and, do you want to come out? Do you want to? He says, cool, I'm in the house. I've got my family in the house, mate. I, uh, he says, can I come over? <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh, where are you, man? I said, no problem, where are you? Uh, I can't remember the hotel. It was the one in uh, Renfield Street. No problem, I'll come up and get you. Get, get half an hour. <laughs> Everybody else in the room. They're all sitting. The girl would get the table done or that. I says, Gail, that lasagna of yours. I says, what do you think? It's quite good. Oh, I'm great. I says, because I've got somebody coming and you'll give it a wee bit of a comparison. <laughs> what are you talking about? Because she'd, she'd been watching it. And if you've been watching, you know he was a brilliant cook. Yep, yep. I said, I've got cool oils coming for some lasagna. <laughs> <laughs> she was like, you know, she went ash and face. What are you talking about? And my ma was there, my, my, her ma and dad, my sisters, my brother-in-law. I said, I said, aye, cool oils coming. So I like, for fuck's sake. So I went up the town, got the bulging. Uh, I remember Parton and Cardano, and there was a group of boys just because I live in a, a main road, Pays Road Westway. It's a group of boys. <laughs> cool, he'll get you. <laughs> These guys are like, ah, is that cool? Is that cool? <laughs> and she, ah, it's a kid to me. Oh, fuck, fuck. Yeah. So, <laughs> take them out of the house. Bomb, bang, bang. Into the, 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 the lasagna, sitting away. Uh, what, we gave him a poker? We gave him a poker. And he, was he spent hours, right? And then he turns to me and he says, Tommy, I, I really should get going. I said, why? He says, I was supposed to be at the, the, the Babalo Club. The Babylon Club, he says, uh, I was supposed to be there a couple of hours ago. Oh, no. What, he like was an supposed to be opening it. Uh, <laughs> he's stuffing his face with Gil's lasagna. And I was like, oh, fuck, Christ's <laughs> sake, mate. Uh, shoving the motor, bang, got him up there. So then, traditionally, the next year, 
Say him again, he phones us up. Do you want to, he said, do you want to ride shotgun with me? He was doing a tour of uh, Scotland, right? I said, I said, my wife would bar I'm <laughs> ride shotgun. But what I have got, the Tartan Army magazine had contacted me. They said, we know you've got contact with Coolio. We want to donate a, a, a kilt to him. Right. Do you mind? Not a problem. And we met at the wee hotel, the one up between, the fancy wee one up between, I can't remember the name of it. Anyway, met up there, presented the uh, kilt to him, got the pictures done, blah, blah, blah. Then he contacted us again to go and meet him uh, somewhere else. Then, 2018, September, I think it was, he contacts us, Tommy, I'm coming to Glasgow. I want you to come to the concert, blah, blah, blah. I says, uh, you're kidding, aren't you? He says, I'd love to go to Parkhead. Because <laughs> I've been telling him all about Selick. Yep. So I'm, oh, no problem. We're playing Hibs. Playing Hibs that Saturday. I'm, oh, for Christ's sake, what am I going to do? So I go into this big fella I know, big Tommy Melville, who owns a few bars and clubs in Glasgow. He says, Tommy, you need to help us out, mate. I need a couple of tickets to get into Parkhead. If Julio wants to come in there. Right, leave it with me. I'll go into the sponsors. They'll usually uh, got some tickets and all the rest of it. Blah, blah, blah. And then uh, I got into uh, your man. Uh, oh God, what's the boy that does the Celtic TV again? Anyway, I, I, I played football with him. Jeremy McCulloch. Right. Um, contacted him about uh, Coolio's coming. You've got this draw. You did a half-time draw. You're always looking for somebody there. How do you fancy? Gangster in paradise. <laughs> coming to paradise. They draw a paradise. Draw. I says, it's brilliant. He's like, you're kidding me. I says, he's available. <laughs> I'll get on to the team. They, they get back to me within a couple of hours. We'd love him to come. We'd love him to come. And there's a couple of tickets in it. <laughs> I was like, yeah, brilliant. it's your beauty. Next minute, Tommy Melville is on to me. I've got you three. I've got you three tickets. Corporate package. Meal. Ticket, the lot. Oh, brilliant. Um, so, um, Coolio and, and me, uh, we go into the, we take the tickets for sell it. I can't kind of use the corporate tickets now, so I give them to Gail and Gabrielle. So they go to the game. Uh, Tommy Melville comes, uh, picks me up. He's got a big Bentley. So he comes and picks me up Cardano in the big Bentley. And we go up to the hotel, he pick up Coolio, shh, drive up to park, he'd, uh, car park, eh, we're here, Coolio's here to do the draw. Oh, no problem, in you go. We go in, and of course, anybody that's gone to Parky, do you know what it's like as you're approaching Parky? It's mobbed, everybody's everywhere. And everybody sees Coolio. Oh, no, and pictures of Coolio. It was absolutely bad. It was a standstill moment. Coolio getting their pictures taken. And then we go into the ground, and we're walking up uh, into the, the main stand, um, lower tier. And as we walk up, of course, Oh, he sees the Dean Brigade across there, and, and Coolio was like, you see his eyes laying up, you couldn't believe it, and then as he uh, starts filling up even more, and they start singing, the Dean Brigade, we have a whole day, Callum McGregor scores a goal, one nothing at the cell, it drops up, and he was like, this is brilliant, <laughs> this, I love the Green Brigade, I love the Green Brigade, <laughs> so yeah, the, uh, the boy, for the, uh, Celtic TV, he's clocked something here. He's he knows I'm not the most popular at the high with the high hygiene's and park he'd the board and all that bunch of Tory <laughs> bastards, some of them. Uh, so he's he's like that himself. He tells me, he says, Now remember, Tommy, uh, you'll not be able to come down track say just Coolio. Now I knew that anyway, but I thought he was he was telling me sort of a f- warning. He says, and it's probably better he doesn't mention you and all that. It's oh look, no problem, no problem. So I say to Coolio as we're sitting, I say, no, look, they're going to come and get you soon. Don't mention me. Don't mention the Green Brigade. Shh, way goes down. And uh, I think it was Mark Wilson was the, the player. And I think it was uh, Jerry. Coolio, how's it going? What brings you to Parkhead? <laughs> My pal Tommy Sheridan. <laughs> and I love the Green Brigade. <laughs> The two things I've told him not to mention. He mentioned them right away. Absolutely brilliant. And he uh, <laughs> does the draw. Uh, and then, of course, uh, they're playing Gangster's Paradise on the speaker system. And the bulging, he's got a scarf. And he instead of getting off, the way everybody else did, 
he's he's the sprint down the, the track and That's he's giving right, a high five. I remember that high five and everybody all the way down, high five and one way back. Now, unfortunately, he then had to go for a sound check because they were playing at the hydro that night. Yep. Um, so he had to go and do a, a, a sound check, so he couldn't stay for the rest of the game. So for anybody who says he was bad luck, he wasn't a bad luck because we were one nothing up. That's right. When, when he left, the game finished two two. Uh, John McGinn scored. That's two what I was going to say. And, the double and, and Callum scored two. That night, uh, we went to the hydro and he gave us these passes. That's access all areas, right? Was it like a nineties reunion sort of? It was a thing. There was, was a few a, salt and pepper. And, that's it. Salt and pepper and. Who's iced tea? Iced tea. Oh, I, vanilla ice. Vanilla ice. Yep. Vanilla ice. I'm sorry, iced tea. I'm <laughs> terrible music. But my daughter loves all this, right? Yeah. Now she's only, what, she's about 13 at the time. Right. 12, 13. 13, I think. So my my wife, my daughter, we go in and here, what is the bulging day? And he's up on the stage. He's fucking pulling me up. <laughs> he's doing his guy. Pulls me up on the stage. We're in the hydro. Now, I've not got a rhythm in my body, day, right? <laughs> I'm standing there like a proverbial spare at a wedding. Yep. I'm, I'm trying to go with the beat of the music. He's giving it loud, they're cool as hell. And then he pulls up my daughter. Oh, super. She is. She's an she's, element. She's loving it. Oh, and, so, and then he was reacting with it and all this. And then, of course, salt and pepper got my daughter up. Yeah. And then your man, ice, bloody vanilla, vanilla ice. ice. He gets her up and starts putting it. And it was, for her, it was a fantastic. Fantastic experience, but I've got it on my oh, yeah. phone video and all that stuff. Absolutely brilliant. She's not embarrassed about it now. She's 15. Now. Oh, don't do that. <laughs> She's not embarrassed about it. It's just the way teenagers are. Yep. Uh, but that was a fantastic time, fantastic night. Um, and, and cooler. we still send messages to each oh, yeah. other. Um, and Terry Christian, we still keep in touch. I used to keep in touch. We, Vern, used to always send me, uh, every July 4th, they would always send me a wee message, Independence Day message. Unfortunately, we... Yeah. Them died, uh, yeah, yeah. Which, which, which is unfortunate. But uh, so that's the that's the story around about Kulu, you know, oh, Celtic, yeah. the gangsta in paradise <laughs> comes to paradise, <laughs> brilliant. Tommy, I've loved having you on the show this week. Um, I'm going to say two words to finish the show, and I just want you to run with it because I'm sure you will. Scottish independence, Dave. We've got to go for it, mate. Um, we have got a situation here where Scotland as a country has got so much going for it. We've got beautiful land, we've got lots and lots of food and beverage industry, we've got oil, we've got gas, we've got the best asset on the planet, which is its people. We've got a hugely talented group of people, we've got universities, research laboratories, we've got everything going for us. The only thing that's holding us back is the ball and chain of Westminster. Westminster's holding Scotland back and they're dragging us down. They're dragging us down and they're usurping all our resources. They're exploiting Scotland. Scotland has a chance to be a good, small country that actually has got different values for England. Instead of investing in spivs and bankers, we can invest in our children and our pensioners and we can use the wealth of Scotland to raise everybody's standard of life. Scotland could be a beautiful, independent country. And we don't even need to lift up an armour light or a claymore to get our independence. Yeah. All we need is a wee lead pencil. That's all we need. People must. There's going to be an NDRF too. Inevitable. I hope it is next year. I'm confident we can have it in 2021. I appeal to everybody, Dave. Have the courage of your Wayne's convictions. Stone up for the future. Get them a better journey in life of an independent Scotland. Brilliant. Ladies and gentlemen, Tommy Sheridan. Mm -hmm.